So hopefully you've come to this volume two of the series, Is It Silver? from the first video series, or the first video in the series, that the series overview, where I talked about some of the concepts we'd be exploring in the series. This series is kind of a treasure hunter series. Uh, and I, what I mean by that is for you folks who go out to the garage sales or Goodwills or auctions or estates, and you're trying to find pieces that look like these. This is kind of unconventional bullion. Uh, and you are trying to scour those places for the best deals that you can to find these pieces made out of silver. Uh, you're a treasure hunter, and I applaud that. I think it's kind of fun. I do that myself. So this series is kind of dedicated to you folks who are doing that. This video, volume two of the series, entitled, Is It Silver? No. So what I'm going to try to do in this video is to give you some ammunition that you can use when you're on those hunts looking for these beautiful pieces of treasure. We're going to try to exclude those pieces that don't have what you're looking for, give you some concepts that you can use, give you some definitions that you can use, give you some of my experience so that when you're out in the field and you're looking for these pieces, you can exclude those things that are going to waste your time, those things that might look like silver, might feel like silver, might even smell like silver, but they are just not silver. And you don't want to waste your time on those pieces because that stops you from finding the real pieces that actually do have the potential, not just in their silver content. Some of these pieces actually have some collector value. So let's, let's explore this and let's give you some definitions to work from and give you some ideas that you can take along with you in the field while you're looking for these pieces, getting rid of the junk, kicking it to the curb, but really keeping those pieces that have the potential. If you're new to the channel, my name is White Cross. I want to thank you for being with me here today. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, I'd like to uh, encourage you to do so, become part of this community. And if you're one of my returning subscribers, thank you guys, as always, for being with me here again today. You know, you guys are one of the main reasons that I'm doing these videos, so it means a lot to me that you're here. I want to thank you for doing that. And if you are new to the channel, I like to begin my videos with a simple disclaimer. That disclaimer is, I am not a financial advisor. I'm not trying to offer any kind of financial advice. I'm simply trying to share some of my experience having bought and sold precious metals and rare coins and interesting objects like you see before you for the last 40 or 30 or 40 years now. And I also like to begin each of my videos with a concept if I can. And this concept is really kind of almost of a mantra. I'm going to give it to you. This is something that... Uh, I started using about five years ago, and I've actually seen other people using it. Uh, maybe I'm not the first person to think of it, but I kind of thought that I was. So let me know what you think about this. The concept I want to share with you is called the golden rule of silver objects. And when I'm talking about objects, I'm talking about objects of virtue, pieces of art. I'm talking about hollowware, like this beautiful silver mug. Uh, we're talking about silverware. We're talking about these kind of unconventional um, things that you can stack as a way of owning precious metals. The golden rule of silver objects. And the golden rule of silver objects is simply this. If it's not clearly marked silver, then 92.5% of the time, it isn't silver. And that's a really easy thing to remember. We'll let that seep in a little bit, seep in a little bit. Obviously, I use the term 92.5 because I could have used anything, right? 99% chance, 90% chance, 92.5 is the percentage purity of sterling silver. And it just kind of helps as almost a mnemonic device. It's something that you kind of keep in the back of your head. The golden rule of silver objects. If it's not clearly marked silver, 92.5% of the time, it's not silver. So there are some exceptions to that rule. And we'll talk about a few of those exceptions here. But for the vast majority of items, there are very good reasons why these pieces would be clearly marked silver on them. And I'm going to go over some of those reasons. A little bit later in this video series, or this video in particular, we'll talk about what is silver plate. We'll talk about some of the definitions that go along with it. I'm going to give you some terms to look for when you see these uh, silver objects on the shelf at the Goodwill or at the garage sale. I'm going to give you some items to look for, some specific names to look for. And if you see those things, 
those are the pieces that you should avoid. I'm going to give you one simple tool of this kind of uh, treasure hunt that has helped me a few times. It's easy to do, and chances are if you're kind of a stacker, you've already got this to take with you. So grab that. I'll give you that uh, piece of advice to take with you out in the field. And we'll also talk a little bit about some of the other forms of metal that objects are made out of that look like silver, but they don't have any silver in them, and they've been fooling people for uh, probably hundreds of years. And then we'll wrap up this video. So we're going to jump into it. You've got the definition for the golden rule of silver objects. 92.5% of the time, if it's not marked silver, it's not silver. Um, that leads us to the concepts that I had at the very end of the first video in the series. Again, if you haven't watched that kind of series overview, go back and take a look at it. I'll pull the link down below so you can see that. I gave you these two groups of objects, and these are pretty similar groups of objects. You've got some silverware, you've got a silver cuff, you've got a couple of silver rings, you've got a couple of silver bowls, you've got a, a big silver plate here. And I asked you to, to uh, kind of pick which one of these you thought was real silver and which one of these are either fake silver or silver plated items. So we're going to go into that a little bit first, and that's going to help us along the way in this video. So show of hands, yell out loud, which one do you think is real? Is it the pieces on the right? Is it the pieces on the left? If you chose the pieces on the right, you're wrong. All of these pieces are either silver plated or fake. And we're going to talk about the definitions of silver plate. We're going to go into just how much silver there is included in a piece of silver plated items. All of these pieces are at least 90% pure silver, and most of them are sterling silver. So I want to dissect a couple of these pieces so you can kind of get a feeling for what we're talking about here. Let me grab this first thing here. And this first item is a, a bowl. This is um, kind of a nut dish. I think it's how it's described. And if we're looking at the bottom, this is typically the kind of thing that you would see in the field. I don't polish my silver items very often, and that's partially because I'm lazy. It's a difficult thing to do. But it's also because pieces like this have uh, surfaces on them. This is called planishing, these little marks. That's actually hammer marks that were made and actually intentionally left on this piece. This piece dates from probably uh, 1895 to about 1910. This is what we would call the arts and crafts era of design. And during this period, design period, they liked the manufacturing marks. That actually was an, an element that they specifically left on these pieces to give them character and charm. And too much polishing, polishing actually wears that away. So this piece in particular is something that I don't polish very often. But again, we're looking at the bottom of this. To so say that you came to an estate sale and you're looking at the bottom of this trying to find a maker's mark on it, you could just barely see the maker's mark. Did you see it in the flash there? I'm going to pull it up as close as I can. And you can see the word sterling. Right, hard to read, but you can definitely see that this says sterling on it. If it says sterling on it, I'm comfortable buying it. Not everybody's definition of sterling was really probably as truthful as it should have been, and we'll talk about some of the instances where that really comes into play uh, a little bit later in this series. But we see the word sterling, and we also see a couple of marks here above it. Do you see that it looks like a lion's head and a bee, I believe? That's an indication that this piece was made in the United States of America by a very specific maker. These are not true hallmarks. We'll talk about hallmarks a little bit later in this video. These are a maker's mark, and we know, uh, I know that this maker is Thomas G. Brown and Sons. Thomas G. Brown and Sons, a very influential and important silver maker, uh, and I'll show a picture of one of the items that's currently on display at the Metropolitan Museum in New York, made by Thomas G. Brown and Sons. So this is a very good piece. This doesn't tell us, that uh, mark doesn't tell us most of the information that's typically uh, found in a true hallmark. And true hallmarks, we'll talk about those a little bit later, are these pieces here. We'll dissect those completely in another, in another video in this series, but I'll talk about them a little bit later as well. So this Thomas G. Brown piece, a very good, nice, heavyweight, solid piece of sterling silver. And I'm comfortable with the fact that it says sterling on it, and I'm thrilled with the fact that it's got the maker's mark for Thomas G. Brown and Sons. Bought this at auction probably 15 years ago, got a great deal on it, came with several other pieces. This is a silver bowl uh, in this second selection, this group here on the left, or the right rather. And if I pull this up, you can see that this too has a maker's mark. It actually says Chippendale. And then right here at the bottom, it says International Silver. I believe that's the maker's mark on this piece. Uh, what does that mean? Um, 
International Silver Company was a company, still is a company, that makes silver-plated items primarily. But you don't see the word sterling there. You do see this, the word silver, but that's part of the company's name, right? That's not telling you what that item is made of. It's simply telling you what the name of the company was. And we're going to talk about why we know, if this doesn't say silver or sterling on it somewhere, that this is not silver or sterling silver. The, the idea of this, uh, the golden rule of silver, really goes back to um, the Middle Ages in, in England, uh, specifically. When I think about pieces that are silver, large pieces like this, uh, silver objects of art or whatever else it is that we're talking about, those pieces were typically made by guilds. Uh, a guild is kind of an affiliation of uh, craftspeople in a very specific field. So you had guilds that were weavers, and you had guilds that were potters, and you had guilds that were barrel makers, and you had silversmiths. That was a guild. And these guilds regulated themselves to a large extent. Uh, they were overseen by the crown, uh, in the case of London. And these guilds would uh, dictate the uh, construction methods that were used by its guild members. And if you were in a city like London, you, you had to be a guild member, a silversmith's member, in order to make and sell silver objects. You were kind of obligated to be part of this guild, and you had to follow the guild's rules. Those guild's rules included the construction method, the purity. They also specified how pieces had to be marked. Now, the guilds worked hand-in-hand -hand with the crown, because the crown was overseeing these guilds largely for revenue, right? They were actually taxing these pieces and they were getting tariffs and duties on these pieces when they were sold. So the crown wanted the guilds to be successful. The guilds wanted to be able to operate somewhat autonomously, independent of the crown, but they, they worked hand in hand with the government. But the government also regulated exactly how these pieces were supposed to be marked. So you had the people that were actually making these pieces throughout history, you know, for the last thousand years anyway, who specified themselves what they wanted to see on these pieces, and that included the silver purity. And then a little bit later, you had the people that were selling these pieces. Now, the silversmiths probably originally owned and operated their own shops, but as we get into the 18th century, 19th century, we started to see the rise of shops that were not necessarily the guild members themselves. They were kind of the precursors to department stores, if you will. And they were carrying all sorts of different products from different guilds. Those people that were uh, getting the items from the guilds also wanted these pieces to be clearly marked silver. And it was important for them because it would have been much more difficult for them to sell these pieces to their customers if these pieces weren't clearly marked. So now you've got the maker and you've got the retailer. And ultimately, you have the person who's buying these items. For much of history, only the richest people could afford uh, objects that were made out of solid silver, right? Coins were made out of silver. So you had to have more than enough money that you didn't need your money in the form of money. You could actually have beautiful objects of art in your home or pieces to eat off of and drink out of. That's a show of wealth. Uh, and it began to be something a little bit more common uh, in the late Middle Ages, probably uh, as the Industrial Revolution really started to kind of take hold. You had a merchant class that was emerging that had more spendable income, more disposable income. And those people wanted the best that they could get. So they wanted solid silver pieces also. And those people wanted their pieces to be marked very clearly, not for their, uh, only for their own records, although that was probably a big part of it as well but also to show off, right? These were prestigious pieces to have. These said that you had enough money that you didn't need to have your coins in the bank. You could have it sitting on the shelf and drink beer out of it every uh, Friday or Saturday night. And you wanted to be able to show that off to your friends and family. You wanted those pieces to be marked so you could be the big shot that you were. So you've got the maker, you've got the retailer, you've got the end customer. All of these folks wanted these pieces to be clearly marked and overarching over all of that is the government that wanted these pieces to be clearly marked and the guild that wanted these pieces to be clearly marked. Again, the golden rule, 92.5% of the time, you start to get the picture here, right? So this tradition carried over uh, into the new world and Americans had different marks and different standards, but for the same reasons, they wanted their pieces to be clearly marked as well. 
And if you've ever gone out in the wild, if you're one of those treasure hunters that's looked for these pieces, chances are that you've picked these pieces up and you've thought, this is definitely silver. I know this is silver. And you've grabbed a piece and you've looked at it very carefully and it looks like silver, it feels like silver, it sure looks like it's got some age to it. And you look at it very carefully and you've convinced yourself that it's silver, but let's see if I can pull this close enough to actually read what it says here. The maker would have marked this very clearly silver and what you see there is community plate do you see that it's kind of small letters and you know, i'll get my pointer here that word plate is really what we're after that is an indication that this piece has been plated with silver so no matter how much it looks feels smells touches you you try to convince yourself that this is something that you found that is sitting on that shelf for for 35 cents and it's a solid silver spoon it's not it's not clearly marked silver or sterling it's marked plate and that is not a solid piece. Let's take a look at one of these pieces that is marked. I don't remember what the orientation is here. Pull this one a little bit closer, see if we can get it there. Uh, of course, it's upside down. It's okay, I'm just filming a video here. Uh, you see that it's marked sterling, right? And you can see that pretty easily with the naked eye. This is actually says that it's sterling. This piece is made of sterling silver. The maker was proud of it. The retailer was proud of it. The person that ultimately bought this piece wanted to have it. Are there exceptions to that? There are definitely exceptions, and that's one of the reasons why I chose that percentage 92.5. Again, 92.5 is the purity of sterling silver. It's just a mnemonic device, but there are exceptions to it, and I'm going to give you a couple of those. Sometimes if a piece had been made locally, let's say that you've got a local uh, jeweler, a local, local silversmith, maybe somebody in your family, maybe you enjoy lapidary, making jewelry on your own. Uh, would you necessarily mark something uh, let's say you were a sculptor and you loved making pieces out of silver and in college you made a beautiful silver sculpture but you signed it but you never felt there was a need to actually mark it 92.5 percent pure right uh, it was going to go into your own collection it was going to sit on a shelf you got to look at it every day but eventually when you pass away your heirs get this piece and they don't know what it is so there are instances where pieces have been made throughout history that aren't clearly marked, but they're few and far between, and that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about trying to allow you to sift and winnow those pieces that are going to waste your time so that you can focus on those pieces that are actually going to pay off for you. So get rid of these pieces, focus on these pieces. Uh, American Indian jewelry is a great um, illustration of some of the pieces that aren't clearly marked. So these pieces, this is traditional Navajo pieces, uh, Navajo, uh, Hopi, and Zuni, traditionally the tribes that used silver and turquoise. That's the blue stone that you see here. And this is a good example of kind of um, home uh, cottage industry silver that might not be marked. When the uh, American Indians, the First Nations, the uh, Native Americans began making silver jewelry in the kind of mid to late 1800s, they were just using silver that they found in circulation, right? That was their source of silver. They were melting down those Mexican pesos or the Mexican Republic or even those eight reales, melting those down. They were melting down the Morgan dollars that were in circulation. They were melting down the barber dimes and barber half dollars and quarters. Those pieces at or very close to 90% pure silver. And they were making these pieces for themselves or close friends and families. You know, uh, American Indians, as an aside, the, uh, the Navajo in particular, I think were kind of some of the first stackers. They were using what wealth they had. They were making it into jewelry and they were wearing these pieces. That was their portable wealth. And when they ran into economic problems, they would take these pieces to the local trading posts, however far away those could be. And they were able to exchange these pieces kind of almost in a pawn shop way to get the goods and services that they needed until they had a little bit more money so that they can buy these pieces back. So I like to think of them as almost the first stackers or at least some very early stackers in our country's history. But they didn't feel the need if they were making these pieces in their own home for themselves to wear to mark the purity on them. They knew that they came from the circulating coins of the time, so why bother marking it? So you will often find pieces from the early eras of American Indian jewelry, and I'm talking late 1800s to probably the 1920s, 1930s, that don't have uh, the purity marked on them. They didn't really feel there was a need to. But as these pieces became more popular with tourists, especially people coming from the East Coast to the West Coast and the American Southwest on our new train lines or new railroads, 
these became kind of tourist pieces. These were mementos that people had visited the American Southwest and seen the American Indian tribes and bought pieces. And those people really did want their pieces to be marked. This is an example of what we would call kind of Harvey era or tourist era. You can see these devices. They look very American Indian. They're really probably not. This is really the kind of things that people on the East Coast of the United States thought of Indians, you know, with the arrowheads and the snakes and the lightning bolts, uh, kind of stylized versions and the, the turquoise here. This piece probably made in the 1930s, maybe 1940s, uh, to be sold to tourists who were coming out uh, to the West. And this piece, you can clearly see that it actually says there, Sterling. So we started to see this. Hopefully I've got that the right way. Uh, maybe, maybe it's the wrong way. We started to see these pieces, I think I had it right the first time, uh, these pieces clearly marked sterling. But some of those early pieces, and even some of those pieces that continued to be made by these American Indian craftspeople, they didn't feel the need to mark them. So yeah, there are some exceptions to these rules. This is another entirely interesting version or area to cover, and maybe we'll do a video about that in the Is It Silver series. So yeah, there are some instances where you will find pieces that are actually made out of silver that aren't marked silver, but that is few and far between and very specialized. So really, we're trying to get rid of these pieces. We're focusing on these pieces. This is where the payoff is. The scourge of these objects, these silver objects, really comes down to silver plate. What is silver plate? These are silver plates. This is not what I'm talking about. Something that is plated has a very thin coating of another metal on it, or another material on it. In the case of silver plate, this was something that was developed in the 1700s. There was a, a silversmith, a coppersmith, really, in the city of Sheffield, England. At least this is kind of how the story goes. In the 1740s, he'd made a copper-handled knife, and he accidentally spilled some molten silver on it. And that silver formed over the, the handle of that knife in such a way that it looked like the handle was made out of solid silver. This process had probably been searched for with varying degrees of success for thousands of years. The concept of having a base metal object, something that was made out of bronze or pewter or copper, that could be fused with a coating of silver or gold to make it look like it was made entirely out of that metal, of that more precious metal. So what he had done is he had invented the idea of a heat bonding of a very thin layer of silver over a base metal, and it uh, caught fire. This was really the first time we talked about uh, you know, the rich people, the people that had lots of money, who were able to have these beautiful silver objects for thousands of years. The poor people or the, you know, just the standard people like you and me didn't have these nice pieces. We didn't have that kind of money. But the invention of silver plate and being able to produce it in large quantities, remember this is kind of at the very beginnings of the Industrial Revolution, this was really starting to become a lot more popular. People who had never had an opportunity to have these beautiful pieces now had a chance to have them. There's something egalitarian about there. There's something nice about that, right? But for those of us in the 2020s who were looking for these things, this is the stuff that's throwing us off. Uh, 1740, this probably was discovered in the 1830s, 1840s, right in Elkington out of um, Birmingham, England. So these are uh, cities that are not terribly far apart from each other. Began making more and more interesting and advanced and, and uh, more detailed pieces, and it really exploded from that point on. So this is really the problem with silver plate. It started to become everywhere, and there were probably many more times silver plated pieces being made now than there were solid silver pieces being made. So these are the items that you're looking for when you go to the store, when you're looking at those auctions, when you're looking at the pawn shop or wherever it else that you're doing your shopping where you're trying to go on these treasure hunts. You're looking for the word Sheffield. That will definitely give you uh, an indication that something at least should be suspect, right? I told you I was going to give you a list of things to kind of look for to help you get rid of these pieces and focus on these pieces. You're looking for the initials EP. Now, often these uh, pieces had marks on them that look very similar to legitimate English hallmarks. Those marks are called pseudo marks, and we're going to do a video about those, but really briefly, while the guild was mandating that the uh, pieces that were being made by the, its guild members had to have these very specific hallmarks on them, 
There was nothing that had to be marked on these pieces that were silver plated. So the people that were making these silver plated flipped the script on that and they decided that they would start making hallmarks that looked like British silver hallmarks. And that was just another way to try to convince people that their pieces were maybe if not solid silver, when really they were probably trying to convince them that they were solid silver. At least they had kind of a little bit more uh, professional um, legitimacy with these pseudo hallmarks. And while they're legitimate hallmarks actually tell us all those very specific things we've talked about, which city it was made in, what year it was made in, what the purity is and who made it, and also if the tariffs had been paid on it. These pseudo hallmarks often didn't say anything. They were just you know, interesting designs that kind of looked like a hallmark was supposed to look. So uh, we'll warn you about those again a little bit later, pseudo hallmarks. EP means electroplate. This is a process of making silver plated items uh, that was slightly different from the heat transfer method that these people had developed in the mid to late 1700s, early 1800s. So the use of electrical current, and this is kind of a reverse electrolysis, I think, the way that they were able to deposit thin amounts of silver onto these items. EP means electroplate. That was kind of a fancy new way of doing it. You know, you're talking about the newest technology. It must be great, right? EPNS means electroplated nickel silver. And we'll talk about nickel silver again in a minute here. So those are some terms to look for already that you can kick to the curb. If it says Sheffield, be suspicious. If it says EP, EPNS, be suspicious. If it doesn't easily, clearly say sterling on it or have legitimate hallmarks, and I know that can be a little bit difficult to ascertain, kick it to the curb. It's going to waste your time. It's going to waste your resources. It's going to waste your dollars while you should be looking for the good pieces. Uh, how thick is silver plate? Let me just talk about that just a little bit because I think there is uh, kind of a misunderstanding within our stacking community just how much silver a silver plated item has. Silver plate has um, several different um, standards within the the silver making community. These are commonly used terms. Some makers use slightly different terms. In some countries, they use slightly different terms as well. But to give you a point of reference, a human hair, the thickness of a human hair, is about 50 microns thick. A micron is one ten or one one thousandth of a millimeter. So a human hair, 50 microns thick. You can see just how thin that is. Uh, the standards that are used, the first standard is called standard plate. Makes sense, right? So this is a silver plating method. Again, plating is just a very, very thin, thin, thin layer of silver over these items that we're talking about. Standard plate, 7.5 microns thick. So uh, human hair, 50 microns thick. Standard plate, 7.5. Then you have double plate, uh, and that is <laughs> clearly double the amount of silver, that's 15 microns thick. Remember, we're still comparing that to a 50 micron human hair. This is ridiculously small amounts of silver, right? You can see how exciting this technology was when it first came about, because you were using not ounces of silver to make something, but fractions of a gram or maybe even grains of silver. That's how little silver there is in these pieces. Triple plate, 22.5 microns thick. The heaviest plate that we see probably in the 21st century, is something called federal spec. And this is something that's used in the military. I think it's also used in technology and science. And that is, uh, the federal spec is 33.75 microns thick. So that is still not even the thickness of a human hair. So to give you an idea, when we were talking about these pieces that are plated with silver, and why they're going to waste your time if you pick them up, they have virtually no silver in them. I mean, if, even if it's like a dollar or two to buy these pieces, it's really just not worth your time. Now, that said, these pieces uh, are made out of more base metals, and sometimes those base metals can be kind of nice, like you've got solid copper pieces, you've got solid nickel pieces. The better quality silver plated pieces were still nicely made pieces of uh, housewares, of homewares. But the thing is that we're focusing here on silver, right? We're talking about precious metals. We're not talking about base metals. Yes, you can make money scrapping. Yes, you can make money from copper pipes and bronze fittings. And you can find enough of these eventually to pay for uh, something. 
But if you're paying even a dollar or two or three for that punch bowl that you find at the Goodwill or this plate that you find at a garage sale, those dollars add up and they keep you tying up your resources for these when you need to be focusing on the good stuff. Silver plate. It contains almost no silver. Isn't that crazy? Those microns thickness, that's just uh, crazy to think about. What else can you avoid? Before we go into what to avoid, let me give you one tool that is easy to take with you. Now, if you're looking at pieces in the field, you're not gonna take your acid test with you, right? You're not gonna take your little vial of silver drops and put them on these pieces to see if this item is actually made out of silver. We'll talk about silver testing equipment again in another video about this, but the piece that I take with me when I'm out on these treasure hunts is just a handful of magnets. Now, this is very important to understand. Silver is non-magnetic, right? These pieces contain uh, nothing that is ferrous that's going to attract these magnets. And not everything that is silver plated is going to be magnetic also. So what we're going to do here is we're just going to reject the pieces that are clearly magnetic. And that way you can at least sift and winnow out those pieces that you know with almost 100% certainty, maybe 92.5% certainty, are not silver, have no chance of being silver. Watch this. That silver plate is in no way, shape, or form going to be silver. No matter how much it looks and smells and feels, it's got beautiful tone on it. Uh, you know, it's got a fancy maker's mark on it. It was only a buck fifty at the Goodwill. It's it's not silver. You're going to waste your time with it. There's no reason to pick that up. Now, if I had done that with another piece, and it had actually not been magnetic. Well, then that's maybe a personal choice. You know, you're going to have to use some of the other terms that we've already talked about here in this video and some of the other terms I'm going to hit you with in just a minute. And maybe you can help make yourself a little bit more of an informed decision to see if a piece is something that bears picking up. If it's a couple dollars and it's starting to add to check these boxes, then maybe this is something you should uh, include. If it's not marked, probably don't pick it up. If it's magnetic, definitely don't pick it up. If you see the word plate anywhere on it, don't pick it up. Uh, if it's not clearly marked sterling, then we run into a little bit of, a, of an, a little bit more of a gray area. So take those magnets with you, definitely. Other things to avoid. All right, I'm going to give you a few other things to avoid that you can just kick to the curb that have no interest for you. These are going to tie up your time and resources. German silver. Anytime you see something that says German silver, it has no silver in it. German silver, first made in the 1750s, we think it was probably very similar to a Chinese alloy that had been made for many, many years before that. 60% copper, 20% nickel, 20% zinc. We're going to see derivations of that a little bit later. German silver has no silver in it. And this is particularly discouraging because you look online, you can look on auction websites, and you see pieces that look like bullion even one troy ounce denominated pieces that proclaim they are 999 German silver. That means that has no silver in it. So even though they look like bullion pieces and it sounds and it feels and it looks exactly like something you can pick up, beware of those pieces. But especially beware of these pieces that are marked German silver. Uh, they have no silver in them. If something says nickel silver, that's another one of these alloys that has no silver in it. Don't even bother picking it up, right? If you see something that says Britannia metal, this one's a little bit more of a gray area because for a brief period of time in England, back going back to England, in the late 1600s, early 1700s, the silver coins were being melted with such a, um, a high speed uh, for people that were making beautiful objects of art like this. The silver coins at the time were 92.5% sterling. That's where the word sterling comes from, crown sterling. So the silversmiths would just melt down their coins, kind of like we talked about earlier with the American Indians. They would take coins out of circulation, and that caused coin shortages. So the king at the time mandated that these objects had to be made out of a more pure version of silver than 92.5, and that was Britannia silver. So if it's Britannia silver, you found something from the late 1600s, early 1700s. But if it says Britannia metal, you see how these manufacturers are kind of twisting these words to make it sound like it's a good thing? Britannia metal has no silver in it. 93% uh, tin, 5% antimony, 2% copper. 
And finally, I'm going to give you another uh, term to look out for. We talked about these American Indian jewelry pieces, these Native American Navajo in particular pieces with turquoise. Uh, Mexico was known for making very, very similar pieces. And Mexico was not immune to this kind of thing either. And I don't, I don't want to necessarily harp on Mexico here. These are the kind of pieces that you saw all over Mexico, Central and South America, down to places like Peru from the 1920s to about the 1970s. This looks like a silver cuff, right? This is a abalone shell here. It's a very beautiful shell. Uh, and this looks like it's made out of solid silver. Let me see if I got this here. Uh, you can just barely make out this mark here, and it says alpaca. Alpaca is another one of these alloys. I believe it's actually very, very similar to nickel silver. It looks like silver. It was made into pieces that were normally made out of silver. It feels like silver. There is no silver in alpaca. So you now have a list of things to look out for. You have a list of a few things to avoid, like EP, electroplate, plate, uh, Sheffield, German silver, nickel silver, Britannia metal, um, alpaca, all of these things kick them to the curb. And again, if you find a piece that you really like the way it looks, and it's clearly marked nickel silver, I'm not saying don't buy it. I'm just saying if we're focusing on precious metals, focus on the things that have a much greater chance of being precious metal, and don't set your hopes on these pieces. They're just going to break your heart. Uh, and I want to see you be successful if you are on these treasure hunts going out looking for these pieces. I talked a little bit about pseudo hallmarks, and we're going to talk about that in another um, video, at least one video in the series where we'll talk about pseudo marks. But it's important to realize that not every other country in the world used hallmarks that were identical to England's hallmarks. They are probably the most famous, but really every European country, and in fact a lot of countries in Asia, had similar marks. They were trying to say that they were made out of silver. The people that were selling them were saying that they're made out of silver. The people that were buying them wanted them to be made out of silver. But the silver standards in some of these places were not as high or were at least different in certain circumstances. So we already talked about Britain using 92.5% silver. In the United States of America, often we melted those coins or at least used that standard. Our standard was 90%. So you often find American pieces, at least in the kind of mid to late 1800s, that were made out of coin silver. That's a term you can look for. That usually means that that item is made out of 90% pure melted down silver coins. So that one's probably okay, especially if you find it at a good price. Maybe pick up those coin silver pieces. But other countries use different standards. In Italy, in Germany, in Russia, uh, and other places in Europe, they used an 80% silver standard. That molesimal fineness is 800, and you often see that 800 mark on pieces. I'll show you an example of it here. This is a little bit more dicey because often these countries used um, pseudo hallmarks and hallmarks that were kind of difficult to decipher. And some of these countries also put out silver plated items and use that 800 number as a way to almost kind of trick you. Remember, a lot of these manufacturers are a little bit in gray areas. I think that their intentions should have been questioned. If you find a nice piece that looks legitimate, that feels legitimate, it's got good heft, it was made well, and it's marked 800, especially if maybe you're seeing hallmarks or uh, words or names or something else that might be Italian or Cyrillic letters that might be Russian, maybe pick that up too, right? So now we've got two different things that you can look for that some other people who haven't seen White Cross's video here are not going to know. If it says coin silver, maybe, right? If it says 800, maybe. If it's not too expensive and if it's worth the gamble for you, then maybe pick those pieces up and you're not going to get to burn too badly if you're paying 5, 10, 15 bucks for something. Don't buy these pieces if they cost three or four hundred dollars, right? That's the that's the entirely not the reason we're doing this. But those are some things that you can look for. So now we've talked about kind of the golden rule of silver. If it's not marked silver 92.5% of the time, it is not silver, right? Remember that mantra. Repeat it to yourself. We talked about what silver plate was, a very thin layer of silver, and it's so little silver that it's honestly not worth picking up, especially if you're really after those precious metals. If you're just after something to collect and you want to get a bunch of copper or bronze, just know that you're probably going to pay more for it, even if it's a buck or two, then that bronze is worth. Just keep that in mind. 
We talked about those things to avoid, the EP, the Sheffield, the EPNS. We talked about nickel, silver, Britannia, metal, German silver, alpaca. Those are things to avoid. Let's talk about those few things that you might want to grab just in case you see them. That's coin silver or something that's marked 800. Sometimes you'll see three numbers also that don't specify 800, maybe 965 or 950. Use your best judgment on those pieces because there is a good possibility. There is at least a possibility that they are solid silver. But again, this is the kind of thing you don't want to spend a lot of money on. Get these pieces cheap, especially if they don't have any other indication that they are silver. And remember to take your magnet with you. It's not gonna tell you if something is silver, but it will definitely tell you if something is not silver. It's worth its weight in silver to take that baby along with you. There we go. Volume two in the Is It Silver series, the answer is no. We've got some great information. Hopefully you uh, are gonna be able to take this with you out into the field. Let me know below if you found something at that estate sale, at a garage sale, if you inherited something from that great aunt that you weren't sure was silver, but you've been able to use this information to maybe, maybe take another look at. What's the best piece you've gotten? I'm not a fan of trying to rip people off, but if you're in a store location and something is clearly marked with a price on it and you see the word sterling on it, uh, what are you supposed to do, right? Pick that piece up because somebody else is gonna get it if you don't. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, please subscribe to the channel. I'd love to have you be part of this community. If you've got questions about any of the things that we talked about here, leave a question down below as well. As I like to say, if you've got that question, there's a good chance that somebody else has that question too. Let's go ahead and knock it out for everybody while we can. If you've got suggestions and other videos that you'd like to see in the Is It Silver series, I'd love to hear those suggestions too. And if you have suggestions about any of the things that in coins or precious metals, leave that comment down below. We're working on lots of interesting new videos as I speak. And as always, thank you for allowing me to be a part of your journey as you go deeper into the world of coins and physical precious metals.